So a very warm welcome to everybody who is joining us at home. And we begin um, with the responses uh, under morning prayer. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Jesus says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ, confessing our sins in penitence and faith. And so we say together, Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sin and restore you in his image, to the praise and glory of his name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we're going to keep a few moments of silence as we remember God's presence here with us. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Well, now we're going to sing our first song of worship. You'll find it on page 10 of the service booklets uh, under the heading Mighty to Save in the middle near the end of that page. It's a song that reminds us of our great need of God. It tells us everyone needs compassion. We need God's forgiveness and love and kindness and mercy. But it also reminds us that God is able to help us in our times of need, that he is mighty to save. And we can make those words our own and offer them to God as our worship as we sing this together. So let's stand to sing this. Everyone needs compassion, a lover's 
let's sit and we're going to hear our reading from the Bible. Our reading this morning is from Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 1, verses 1 to 8. And you can find this in the Blue Pew Bibles on page 1182. Colossians 1, 1 to 8. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven, and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you, since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word. We pray that you would speak to us through it by your Spirit and help us to receive it and respond to it with glad and joyful hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, throughout January and February, we're going to be looking at this wonderful letter of Paul to the church in Colossae. It's one of Paul's prison letters, so we know he was writing from his incarceration, because right at the end of the letter, in the very last verse, he asks them to remember his chains. So Paul is far off from these Colossian, Colossian Christians, and he's concerned about them. He's worried that in his absence, when he's not there to look after them, they might somehow be led astray from real, authentic, genuine Christianity. And we know that's his concern because later on in chapter 2, he um, he says, don't let anybody deceive you. And don't let anyone take you captive through hollow and deceptive ideas. Don't let anyone abduct you or kidnap you with wrong teaching. You see, there were other teachers who came in in Paul's absence saying, don't listen to Paul, listen to us instead. But the message they were uh, proclaiming wasn't genuine, real, authentic, apostolic Christianity. And it's always good for us to remember that there's only one sort of Christianity. That's the apostolic Christianity that we have in the Bible. Anything else is a bit of a fake, a sham, and nobody likes to be palmed off with something that isn't genuine. And that's Paul's concern for them. It's why, as he begins a letter in chapter 1, he introduces himself. This is the, the usual way in the ancient world. You'd start a letter, you say who it's from and who it's written to, and you greet people. But Paul, introducing himself, says 
uh, describes himself as Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. It's a reminder that he is chosen by God as an apostle and sent by God with God's message. So like the other apostles, he's not making up something or just sharing his own ideas and opinions. As an apostle, he's sharing God's message, God's view, God's idea. And when we agree with him, when we receive his message, we're receiving God's message as we do so. So, Paul puts that in really as a reminder to the Colossians not to stray. He also reminds them that the letter is for them. And let's look at how he describes them. He says it's for the holy and faithful brothers in Christ in Colossae. Faithful there. We could, we could put as faith-filled, because the word really means believing. So here we've got a little uh, description of them in a nutshell, and not just of them, but of every Christian. The holy insofar as they've been set aside by God, given a wonderful new life to live for him. They've been forgiven of their sins, invited to live a new life of love. They've been given a sure hope of heaven. And they've received all those promises by believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus. They are faith-filled. And that's true, not just of them, but of us, of every believer in Jesus. When we trust in, in the Lord, we have wonderful promises and blessings that we can receive. And not least of those are the grace and peace that Paul wishes to them in the second half of verse 2. Grace is sometimes summed up with a little acronym. Um, well, grace is the acronym for God's riches at Christ's expense. It's a handy, handy way of remembering what grace means. Grace means all the blessings and good things that God gives to us. But they're at Christ's expense. The nature of grace is that it's a gift. God gives us all these good things, but he doesn't say, well, earn them, deserve them, score up enough points to receive them, do enough good deeds, and maybe you'll merit them. Grace is undeserved favour, won for us by Jesus at the cross, received by us as a gift through faith. And one of those blessings in particular is peace. And don't we need that more today than perhaps ever? Peace with God as we're forgiven. Peace in our hearts, in all the troubles and trials of life. And peace with others as we live out that life of love God gives us. Well, that's Paul's introduction. It reminds us who the letter's from, who it's to, and, and what it's about. It's receiving all the blessings and goodness of God. And as we look at Colossians in the weeks ahead, we'll see there's a lot of challenge and encouragement in this letter. But Paul begins with thanksgiving. And that's really what we're looking at this morning. In verse 3, he says, We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Thanksgiving is such an important part of our Christian living. When we pray, we should always be thanking God for his many blessings. The very act of thanking God drags our mind away from our problems and troubles, fixes our thoughts and focus on God where it belongs. Thanksgiving reminds us that there are good things in every day. And it is a source of joy and peace for us. Just the very act of thanking God can lift our spirits 
and draw us a little closer to him. Perhaps that's why it's the custom of many Christians to thank God every morning and evening for the, the blessings that we've experienced the day before. And certainly, um, a thankful heart is a, a joyful heart. We have so much to thank God for, but Paul here in particular is thanking God for the Colossian Christians, for the experience of God that they have had in their lives. So it's not just a general thanksgiving, it's a very specific one. He says we always thank God when we pray for you because, and this is verse 4, because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints. If we were to ask ourselves, how could we sum up in a sentence, a phrase, what being a Christian means in practice, what it looks like, how it's experienced, then we could do a lot worse than these words of Paul in verse 4. It's living a life of faith and love. Faith in Christ Jesus, that's where we begin. Faith is what opens the door to all of God's promises. It's how we lay hold of his blessings. Faith is not just trusting that God means his promises and he's good for them, although he does, he always, always keeps his word. But more than that, it's also saying yes in our hearts to him. A little like a, a marriage proposal, if you like. God invites us into that committed relationship with him but faith is our response of saying yes not just that we believe he means it but that yes we want it we choose to trust him choose to lean on the promises choose to believe that they're real for us that they'll take our weight that they will begin to transform our lives and faith is also having that confidence that God is able to hold us safe through all the trials and troubles and difficulties of life. Something I'm sure Paul needed to do in his prison cell. It's something we all need, because life's often beset with difficulties, and we need to remember that God is good and that we are secure with him. So faith. Is part of what the Christian life is about. But also love. Love is our response to God's love for us. It's the overflow of that love to others. It's the distinguishing characteristic of Christians as we grow in our faith over time. We become more loving. Of course, we may not be starting from a very loving place. We... We might wake up and think, well, I don't feel very loving today, but if God is at work in us, we'll be a little more loving than we were. And our love originates in being aware of God's love for us. The Bible says we love because he first loved us. And so if we find that our hearts feel cold, that we're not as warm and loving as we'd like to be, then the sure remedy is to reflect on the cross. To think about the depth and breadth and height and length of God's love for us. To marvel that he has loved us from before the beginning of time. That he knows us by name. That he loved us so much that he gave his son to die for us. That nobody could love as deeply or wonderfully as he does. It's that love for us that softens hearts and changes attitudes and kick-starts our ability to love others. And it is a work of the Holy Spirit within us. That's why in verse 8, when Paul speaks warmly of the description of the Colossian Christians that he's been given by Epaphras, he says that he has told us of your love in the spirit, a loving heart 
is a work of the Holy Spirit in us. And it brings joy and delight to God to see gentle, loving, caring hearts among his people. That's what Paul sees in these Christians. Faith in Jesus, love for others, and he rejoices in it. He thanks God for them. And when we pray, we should thank God for not just the work of God in our own lives, but what we see in our fellow believers, for the encouragement they are to us. It's an encouragement to me to be meeting with you this morning, to look out and see you looking back. It's a, an encouragement for all of us to be aware of one another's prayers and faithfulness and perseverance, often in difficult times. Paul wants them to know that he's thanking God for them. But the other big idea in these first few verses of Colossians is he wants to know them to know where that Christian experience has come from. And with good reason, because if they know where it comes from, they'll be less likely to stray from it. So where does our faith and love come from? Where did theirs originate? How did it happen? that they have this wonderful faith in God, when before they didn't? Well, the simple answer is because the gospel was preached to them. Paul has been out and about proclaiming the apostolic message of Christianity, and he's had some helpers with him, Timothy and Epaphras, who've gone around relaying that message to others. And so it's because Epaphras has come and told them the good news, the gospel, the promises of God, that they have this experience of faith and love. They wouldn't have otherwise. And so in verses 5 to 8, we see Paul just explaining how it works, how they came to believe, how they have this hope. Verse 5, he says, the faith and love that he's thanking God for spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven. It's not quite the hope of heaven, although that's included in it. It's the hope that's in heaven, kept safe for them. The hope that they, sure hope, that they can be put right with God through faith in Jesus. Not by their own works, not having to keep on that treadmill of trying to earn God's favour and never quite being good enough, but simply coming to God in faith, trusting not in what they've done, but in what Jesus has done. Not that they're good enough, but that Jesus is good enough for them. That on the cross he's done everything needed so that they can receive those promises by faith. That's their hope. And how did it come to them? How did they hear of it? Well, Paul says, the faith and love spring from the hope that's stored up for you in heaven and that you have already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. If you hadn't heard it, you wouldn't have believed. If you hadn't believed, you wouldn't have received all the blessings. And the reason Paul reminds them is he doesn't want them to head off in some other direction, to chase after some other substandard version of Christianity that isn't really Christianity at all. He wants them to stick with the real, authentic, genuine, apostolic Christianity. The one that we believe that we have here in the Scriptures. In fact, that's the only message that Paul has proclaimed. It's the one that is spreading throughout the ancient world, not just in Colossae, but in Philippia, and um, Philippi, and Ephesus, and Corinth, and all around um, Asia. All over the world. I think Paul means the Roman world. This gospel is bearing fruit and growing. 
just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. And how did they hear it? They heard it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who's a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. Not Paul directly, but Epaphras, who relayed the same message. And it was life-changing. They heard it and they believed. And that's why Epaphras was able to speak of their love in the Spirit. Why does Paul go to such great lengths to remind them of how they heard such precious promises? How they received it? What a difference it's made in their lives. It's so that they and we with them would hold firmly to that apostolic message. That we wouldn't be led astray. That we wouldn't drift off in some other direction away from God's grace. Away from his goodness. Away from his loving kindness. But instead we'd remember with thankfulness that our sins have been forgiven. That we have a new life of love to live and a sure hope of heaven and that God offers that wonderfully, gloriously to everyone who believes and trusts in the Lord Jesus. So today let's treasure those promises in our hearts and let's not stray from them. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, in all the sorrows and struggles of this life and all its hardships and difficulties help us to hold firmly to your promises to remember that whatever else happens that if we trust in the lord jesus we are safe with you sure of heaven sure of your love and help us to know that certainty in our hearts and to experience your love as you enable that to grow by your Holy Spirit within us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to respond to God's word by joining in the words of the Creed, which are on page three of the service books. And we can remain seated to say this together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. Well, in a moment we're going to pray, but before we do so, we're going to sing again um, a song from page 14 in the songbooks, um, Faithful One, which is, I think, um, on the right of that page.
Well, now let's sit or kneel to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy, for the joy and peace which you give to all those who believe and trust in Jesus, for the forgiveness of sins and the promise of new life and the sure hope of heaven. Thank you for all those Christians who have inspired and encouraged us by their faithful perseverance and their trust in your word. Help us to have thankful hearts for all your goodness to us and give us opportunities to be a blessing and encouragement to others. We pray for all those who are going through trials and difficulties of any kind. For the lonely and the bereaved, the unwell and the despairing. Please draw near to them and to us with the comfort of your presence and the reassurance of your love. Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our life, Make known your heavenly glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, now we're going to stand to sing our final hymn together. It's number 559 in the Orange Songs and Hymns of Fellowship. To God be the glory, great things he hath done.
now may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest on each one of you, now and always. Amen.